Hello, my friends. Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. I thought I would just do my daily vlog live this morning for two reasons. Number one, that way I don't have to edit it. And, you know, you just have to live with my mistakes. <laughs> Which, I never make any mistakes. <laughs> uh, pretty much doing this in general is a mistake, probably from most people's perspective. Anyway, I did make a number of changes to the uh, setup here for my live streams, and so I wanted to test them out and see if they're going to work so that uh, when I do my shop talk on Friday, we would know. Uh, might just uh, start off by saying I uh, hope everybody had a happy 4th of July, and I hope you got to uh, eat a lot of hot dogs and uh, got to uh, watch some fireworks. I got my fireworks this year from... Uh, Outdoors with the Morgans. That's another YouTube channel that I like to watch. And uh, Mike, uh, the Outdoors with the Morgan guy, he uh, used to be a powder monkey, I think. He used to handle explosives for, I guess, the highway department or something like that. Anyway, it was some road crew type thing that he used to work on that uh, he was uh, kind of handled the explosives. So I guess it falls in line that he could do a, a fireworks show. Looks like we are live because I see 24 viewers popped up there. John Lagoria, good morning, he says. So that's the first uh, comment I see. Um, anyway, I, uh, you know, didn't really have much of uh, a, a way of a celebration yesterday, but I did work in the shop for a little while in the morning, and then I pretty much took the rest of the day off and just kind of relaxed and mostly watched YouTube for the most part. Um, why did I call this my hopes have been dashed? Well, my hopes have been dashed because of this. I thought I was going to be making a video this morning that says, I told you a huge lie, but I'm happy about it. As it turns out, my hopes have been dashed and I'm not happy about it. The huge lie was going to be, I think, you know, a couple weeks ago or a week or so ago, I said, um, in my lifetime, we will never, ever get fiber optic here on this farm. Well, like the very next day after I make a statement like that, I hear a rumor that they're bringing fiber optic through, crossing over my son's property, going to Newburgh, and it's done by the electric co-op. So about 10 days ago, I called the electric co-op and I said, uh, man, I heard a rumor that you're going to be bringing it over there. Well, the girl on the phone didn't discourage it at all. She just said, well, you'd have to come in and make application at the office. I said, to apply for your fiber internet? Yeah, you have to come in and do it. I said, I can't do it over the phone? No, 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 you have to come in. So this morning, bright and early, I get up and head up there, and about the time their doors open, I'm walking in, and I tell them the story that I'm, you know, one of their customers and I want to get fiber optic internet service. Well, the girl goes and checks, and she's gone like 10 minutes, and she comes back. She says, I'm sorry, but we don't have it available for you, and uh, we don't really have a date or anything. Ah! I really thought I was going to get lucky there, and we were going to get fiber optic internet service here on the farm. And it looks like there's a good chance we will someday, but not in the immediate future, unfortunately. So I was hoping I was going to say, I told you a huge lie, <laughs> and but I'm happy about it. And now I'm just like, hopes are dashed once again, and I'm not happy. <laughs> Bummer. Uh, you see the mandolin sitting there. I... Uh, you know, I told you that I rushed the finish on it, and I put it together before the finish was really done, and that's true. So I started yesterday, uh, you might be able to see it, yeah, well, right here, there's a spot where I started putting drops of finish in, fill, you know, drop fills of places where the finish had either sunk in or sucked into a crack or a hole or whatever, you know, wood pours do all kinds of craziness. And then especially around all this inlay, all of those little pieces, you know, the air, you know, gets in between there. Even if you think you've got them meeting up perfect and the finish gets sucked down in those little cracks. So I went around and drop filled all these cracks yesterday. 
So I've got lots of little drop fills to do, and that'll probably take me another few days to get all the drop fills done around the edge of the binding, all kinds of places. Once I get those done and I'm satisfied with them, then I'm going to probably lightly sand those, and then I'm going to take it all apart and, uh, you know, spray it uh, with another coat or two of the actual varnish that I'm using here, which is the True Oil Varnish. It's a gun stock varnish, but uh, oil varnishes are very good for acoustic sound. So anyway, that's the story. And then once I get that done, then I'm hoping to schedule an appointment with the boys down at the acoustic shop down in Springfield, Missouri, the, and uh, set the Chapmans down there, and set up a time to uh, you know make a video down there with those guys playing this, or me playing it with them, or whatever. I don't even know how that's all going to turn out yet, but we'll see. But uh, that's the status of that right now. The um, Dickie's Barbecue status uh, looks like it's looking up again, even though uh, two of the guys can't be there because they have COVID tonight. Um, so in other words, Gary, the guitar player, and Bill Pilliard, uh, the uh, other guitar player that plays more of the lead, neither one of those guys are going to be able to make it tonight at uh, the uh, barbecue pit. But uh, quite... Fortunately for me, uh, my banjo player from the St. Louis area, Leon Pruitt, he's a longtime friend of mine, been in the band since 1991. We just don't use him very often anymore because it's so far for him to drive down here. But he called and volunteered and said, I'd like to come down tonight. And I said, absolutely. So that's going to be awesome. It's going to be uh, Leon Pruitt, the banjo, myself on mandolin. Beverly is going to be there, and she'll probably either be playing guitar or uh, dobro, probably guitar. And then Don, the bass player, is planning to be there. So we'll have a good four-piece band there tonight. So if you are in the area or passing through, be sure to stop in this evening at Dickie's Barbecue Pit in Rolla, Missouri, around 6 o'clock or so. Um, I, over the weekend, I cleaned up that the dark side over there, the metal shop. And man, I found more stuff just piled up. and you know It, it becomes a storage shop instead of a workshop. And that's, that's one thing you need to always watch in your workshop, is to not let it become a storage area. And that's really what had happened over there. People don't know what to do with stuff, so they just set it in there. And then I get busy, and I don't have time to move it and do anything, so it just gets pushed into the corner. So I cleaned up most of that. I still have a lot of cleaning up over there to do. And while I was at it, I repaired things. That's another thing. People will sit stuff in there expecting me to repair it. And, you know, again, I don't have time or can't get to it. Well, I repaired a number of things in there over the weekend too, like a step stool and a uh, miter saw, one of those, you know, wood miter saws that, so it was completely busted and broken up, but I repaired it all and it works just fine. Set it up perfectly square. So that's just another tool that's basically just going up on a shelf. Nobody has a real need for it right now, but uh, anyway, it's there to be used when we need it. Um, that's about all I was going to talk to you about this morning here, just bringing you up to date on where I'm at. Well, the Gibson here, um, I showed this the other day, I showed this yesterday, I guess, on the vlog. I started buffing out some of the finish here, you can see, and it's starting to buff out, but it's going to take some work. Um, and, then I, and then I started doing more drop fills on this. The, the finish had been sitting for so long that it sucked into some cracks and things, it dried up. It basically dries into those little imperfections that are in the wood. They've been fixed, they're, they're not loose or anything, but the way that finish works, it just sucks down into any kind of a pore spot. So I'm working on those, trying to clean those up. It just never ending, never ending. So when the guy, so the other day on the shop talk, when the guy says, well, I'd like to refinish my instrument, you know, what do you recommend? I said, I recommend getting another instrument because <laughs> finish work is the hardest part of it. I haven't done any more to the mandolin. Um, you'll, again, you're going to see a full video or uh, the rest of the videos on that Gibson and you'll see a full video on this eventually. But uh, I have this all leveled and, uh, you know, I've, it was uh, tilted, I think, this way, and I've, I've straightened that up. 
Um, the next thing I've got to do to this is to uh, put a wedge in here to bring it up high enough because this has got an exceptionally high domed arch in the middle. It doesn't really look that high on camera, but it's, it's exceptionally high compared to most of them. And uh, so this, this neck angle is just not high enough. And yeah, you could take the neck out and all that, but it's already been taken out once and put back in. And it is solid, it's not loose, and I'm not willing to take it apart again because who knows what they did when they took it apart. Who knows what kind of glue they used, who knows whatever they did. And I can tell it wasn't done by a real professional. They did a pretty good job, but you know, it's pretty rough around there too. So that's why I just don't want to deal with it because they may have used epoxy or who knows. And I could just be opening up a huge can of worms and on a mandolin of this value, and I'm not saying it's a poor value instrument, it's just kind of a medium value instrument. I would not go to all the expense to do that because you would be paying me a lot of money to do all that. And it's much faster, much cheaper to put a wedge in and nobody will even hardly notice it when I'm done. And when you get right down to it, the wedge is fairly easy to adjust the height and get it just exactly right. So that's what I'm planning to do. If y'all have some questions, I'll go ahead and take a few questions. Uh, looks like there's one here that I cannot even begin to pronounce that username and won't even try. He says, hey Rosa, since uh, the red label that you worked on was from the 60s and the 70s, what do you think of the sound from the Yamaha? That Yamaha had a great sound. It had a very, very good sound. Yeah, you, you couldn't ask for much more out of an instrument. That was a, you know, for, for an off-the-shelf type instrument, it was as good as it gets, I think. It was a very good sounding instrument, I thought. So, um, do y'all have any other questions or anything? Because I'm not going to make this go real long. <coughs> Pardon me, excuse me. Um, make a mess right on camera. <clears throat> um, but if you do have any questions, just feel free to ask them. Very good sound and picture, Jerry. That's good. Yeah, I was able to change the resolution on this. Well, it wasn't exactly a resolution setting. It, I'm telling you, the things are buried deep in this thing. To, to make changes, they're not where you think they're going to be. I don't know. Streamlabs OBS is awesome software. That's what I'm using. It's awesome so software. But it, you can change one thing, and it'll change 15 other things. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. It, it, it's hard to explain. I mean, I think it was... Well, I just don't know. I don't, I don't want to make any suggestions or recommendations about who did what on it. But it's a very good little bit uh, free type software and I think there is an, a professional option where you can pay for it but right now I'm not paying if I may get to the point where I start paying for it uh, if if I feel like that'll help me but uh, right now I'm just trying to learn what this one does let alone go into the professional version uh, Michael Boyer who do you buy fretboards from uh, generally just from uh, Stu Mac for the most part um, I have bought them from other places. I have bought them from LMI out in, uh, not applicable, just subscribed. So do you notice that little thing that popped up there? That was another thing I was experimenting with, trying to get those pop-ups to uh, happen. Um, if somebody gives a super chat or whatever, that's supposed to pop up there too. I, you know, I don't even, that would kind of surprise me that it actually worked because <laughs> I was having trouble getting that to work too. Um, okay, so fretboards, that's where I get most of them. I, I do buy some from LMI out in California. What's your, <laughs> you guys keep baiting me. What's your favorite hide glue? <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Uh, it's in, as somebody answered it for you, it says, it's in the trash. That's my favorite one. Yeah, my favorite high glue is in the trash. You know, you know, I don't know how to explain it any differently, but it, the truth is, high glue, I don't think it's horrible. I just think there's stuff that's way better now. And I just trying to dispel the myth that it is the ultimate. It's the best. It's the only thing you can use. 
If you want to use hide glue, I don't have a problem with you using hide glue, but you just should know that it stands for holds initially, delaminates eventually. Unless it's the kind that Yamaha used, and then it takes, you know, a, a uh, dynamite to, uh, to get it apart. <laughs> so it's so inconsistent is the real problem with hide glue. Okay, enough on that, and quit asking about hide glue. <laughs> Uh, John Jenkins, he didn't put any question marks, but he says, is it more difficult to make a left-handed mandolin? I'm left-handed and get f frustrated by the lack of choice. Um, not really, John. Uh, I had offered to make a left-handed mandolin or two for a couple of left-handed people I know, and uh, I guess I was too expensive for them, you know, so that's probably the main issue is the expense. Uh, for me, it's going to be expensive because, I, especially now, I don't even really want to make one because um, with my hands. That's why I turned down a ridiculous offer for this. Um, so I, and I say ridiculous, I think it's worth it. I wouldn't sell it for that. That's why I turned it down. But uh, on the other hand, it was a lot of money and I probably should have had my head examined. But so the expense is, is your only real uh, deal. It's not any harder to make a left-handed one. It's more like uh, keeping it in your head during the whole build that you're building this left-handed because there is a lot of differences, a lot of changes. Everything I would do, I would have to mirror it um, because, you know, even the carving, I would carve it. If I was going to carve it like that 24 lower that I carved here, I would have to reverse all of the measurements and carve them in the opposite location, you know. And I would do all of that if it were if I was building it, but you would also pay a huge price tag. So that would probably be your only issue. It's not so much that it's more difficult. Um, how would you, in your opinion, go about straightening a neck on an old uh, set neck guitar without a truss rod? Um, for straightening it, in my opinion, Tom, the only way you can straighten it is to straighten it mechanically. I don't believe in the heating and, you know, the voodoo that people do all the time and humidity and all kinds of craziness that all of that actually does work. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But I, I hope everybody hears the way I really mean about these things because a lot of people will hear just a part of it and they take off with that. What I'm saying about that is you can fix them by heating them and pressing them back into shape and all that. What I mean though is that it will not last. It will go back to the same shape it's in now. So you've wasted your time. Now, having said that, if, if it's not an expensive guitar, then the way I'd probably try to do it, well, you could do one of two things or maybe both at the same time because it would probably make more sense to do both at the same time. I would take the fretboard off of it. If, if it's got like a, a big underbow or something like that, or even, even if it's got a twist, I would take the fretboard off of it. I would try to carve out some of the problem a little bit, if you could. Uh, or if you don't think you need to, if you could just back bow it or whatever, or, or somehow twist it and, and make that okay. And then re-glue the fret, you know, make sure you clean all the glue surfaces off and then you would re-glue the fretboard down and you would try to re-glue it down with a little bit of opposite of the problem. In other words, if it had a, a big underbow like this, you'd probably want to put a very, very slight overbow in it and glue the fretboard down. And, and then when it relaxes, when you take the clamps off, it, it'll straighten itself back out and then the strings will pull it about where it should be. But if I was going to go to that much trouble and do that, I would also put a truss rod in it while I was doing it. And I would make sure I put a truss rod in it that has a good underbow so that when you tighten it, it will pull the middle up. Um, so that's how I would go about it. I mean, it's not a simple five minute job, and, uh, but the heat lamps and the humidity and all that stuff works. But in my opinion, it's just smoke and mirrors. That's all it is. It's just smoke and mirrors. It's not going to last. Um, should a banjo be hard to fret? Absolutely not. Banjos should be crazy easy to fret, actually. 
uh, partly for two reasons. Number one, you don't need to set them up very high, and number two, uh, the strings are even lighter on banjos than they are on a guitar, so it should be very easy to fret. Um, can you recommend which kinds of chisels are needed for basic repairs? Well, you know, I mean, you don't have to have anything real expensive or real fancy for years and years. 25 plus years, 30 years even. I just use some basic, um, fairly cheap uh, wood chisels, you know, just with plastic handles and things. And just, but they, they held an edge good. Uh, you know, it's more of, it's, it, you have to have good steel that holds the edge. If it doesn't hold an edge, you're wasting your time. If you have to sharpen them just continually, then get something better. But you don't need real expensive chisels. You really don't. I, I use, for, for 30 years, I just used plain old, off-the-shelf, out-of-the-hardware store type chisels. And they were fine. And I even donated those to uh, Caleb when he left. I think he took some of them with him. I'm not sure if he did or not. He may have chose to do something different. But anyway, um, that's all you really need. You don't need much. It just as long as they hold an edge. Can you hear a difference between a guitar made with hide glue and one with tight bond? John C., absolutely not. And there will be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the hide glue heads that will tell you you can, but none of them would be able to tell in a blind test. I absolutely guarantee you for sure there's no way they would know the difference in a, in a blind test. Not a chance. Not a chance. There's no difference. The glue... I'm not saying it doesn't make any difference, but even a dog couldn't hear it. Um, yeah, it's not going to make any difference, unless you just do something stupid, like just pour glue all over the place or something like that. But if you use it the way you should use it, no, they're not going to hear any difference at all. Zero, none, not one bit, no matter what they say, because they all say they can. that that's why they use it. It sounds better. It comes apart easier. It's this, it's that, and it's all a bunch of lies. It's just stuff that's been fed down through the years because it was traditional. I'm not opposed to tradition, not at all. In fact, there's a lot of traditions I still do. But when they need to be improved, I improve them. And that's just the bottom line. Um, I had a scratch on my mandolin and I patched the scratch with nail polish. Yeah, I've done that. Uh, nail polish does work. Uh, you know, you can fill holes and things with nail polish. Um, it's sometimes a little harder than the other types of finish around it. So sanding it down might be your only issue. Same way with super glue, though. I mean, it, it can be harder than your finish around it, and so you can fill with super glue too, but then it's really hard to sand it out sometimes without sanding out the other part of the finish. The, the harder finish, like if you, fill, if you fill a spot with a harder finish, then it's, that harder thing is harder to get rid of, and you know, the, the surrounding part will go down. And so you, you don't, you're kind of chasing your tail trying to get it level. That's why you, you do that uh, razor blade trick with the, put the tape on both sides of the razor blade, just leave the very center of the razor blade exposed, and then you scrape down your fill with that razor blade. Yeah, it's finishes, they're just the most difficult thing ever. There's nothing more difficult on an instrument than the finish. Uh, you, people think that building them is the hard part. It's not. It's not at all. Not even sort of the hard part. Um, I'm new to your channel. Uh, do you work on violins or have a recommendation? Yes, I do work on violins. I've built, I don't know how many for sure, but I'm going to say five, four or five violins from scratch. Um, Emery's little sister, Grace, has one of my violins, and um, she's quite attached to it. And uh, I built one for a, a girl in the area that was taking lessons, and it turned out awesome. I mean, this thing had the best sound. It was just a killer violin. And when we, uh, and she made me finish it purple. So it's a killer sounding purple violin. Yeah, bummer. I, I told her, I said, you know, you're taking a $3,000 instrument here and you're turning it into a $100 garage sale item when I make it purple, right? 
I don't care if that's what I want. I said, okay, let's, let's do it. And so I did it. Bummer. But yeah, I have made quite, uh, several violins, and I have restored, uh, for you that it's new there, uh, if you check out uh, chocolate, just type, in, go into YouTube, just type in RSW and the word chocolate, and then follow that series of videos about how I re restored a very crushed violin. You would enjoy that, I'm sure. Um, John C. must have liked my answer because he has laughed out loud. Uh, can you hear a difference? Yeah. Okay, I guess he just wanted to see me rant again. But the truth is, there's no difference. Uh, but there, that's the big myth that there is, you know, and it's just not true. Hide glue users have to race to mate surfaces before the glue turns to gel. I would rather use modern glue that gives you a little more time. Yeah, that's another advantage. There, there's no doubt. But, you know, if you just use plain old everyday common sense and think about it, there's way more disadvantages to trying to use hide glue than there are advantages. From any angle you want to approach it from. You know, that's just the bottom line. I mean, the first angle is that you got to kill an animal and take its hide. I mean, that's the first one. And I, I'm not opposed to hunting or killing of, of animals. I, you know, and I know some of you are, and you don't have to kill me uh, uh, because of that. But, uh, but my point is, I'm a hunter, and I eat meat and all that stuff, and um, it's just the way it is. So I'm not opposed to the fact that they're using hides for that. As long, you know, I'd rather see them do that and the hide doesn't go to waste from that perspective. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, it, it's not consistent. It, 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 just the fact that they have to make it from a hide will tell you it's not consistent right from the beginning. It's just, uh, there's just a lot to it. You're boiling a hide and taking all that gelatin and all that I don't know, pectin and all the stuff that comes out of those hides and whatever that stuff is, and I'm no expert on that. But anyway, it's just not consistent it, it, because of the temperatures you make it at and because of all the different factors that contribute to it. And then the fact that you have to use it and when you heat it up, you can change its properties by the way you heat it up if you get it too hot or not hot enough and all of, there's just on and on and on and on why it's not consistent. Was it purple paint or purple dye? It was purple dye, and uh, it it really was a beautiful. Well, it's on my. I think I have it on my website. I I think it's one of the violins I show on my website, or the only one I show on my website, in fact. But it it had a gorgeous sound. I mean, it really did. I would put it up against any any violin out there. Really, I mean, it was that good a sounding violin. It, sadly, it's purple. <laughs> Uh, on the Yamaha, is the glue used could formaldehyde the use the glue less on top? Or, I'm not sure I follow that question. I'm not sure it's written where I can follow it. On the Yamaha, is the glue used could formaldehyde, comma the one used for gluing less Paul top or apply? I don't know. I don't know what you're asking there. It. it, it so I, I can't really answer it, but yeah, maybe. Um, I'm going to cut it off there. We're at uh, a 30-minute deal, and that's about how long I wanted to keep it there. There's looks like there, we're not quite 30 minutes, but there's one more last question. I'll see if I can answer that one. Working on my bench today, what is your preferred height for a workbench? Oh, you know, I don't really know that I have a preferred height. I'll just tell you what mine is. Um, this one is about 34 and 3 quarters to the top of the bench. Now that doesn't include the carpet. So, uh, you know, the top of the bench is 34 and 3 quarters. Now, so it is fairly comfortable at that height to work on stuff. And I have one of these chairs that goes up and down. So, like, I can raise this chair up. And if I need to be higher, like if I'm working on something taller, I can raise this chair up and work on something taller, or I can put the chair down. So I, I think the chair is probably more important than the, uh, than the exact height of your workbench. Um, but this is a pretty good height. I, I like it. 
it fits me really good. But then again, I think it depends on how tall you are and all those kinds of things. There's a lot of people out there. I think if you look look around, there's people that will make recommendations like the height of you know certain parts of your body. You know, it should maybe come at your wrist height or something. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I'm just saying I've seen things like that, and I don't know what those recommendations are, but I'm sure they're out there. Does my friend still make the antler products? Uh, well, lately he hasn't. Um, that's um, the one that had the COVID, uh, Ron. Um, since he 